background. We're not going to try to explain them. So if you have any questions about them, just ask us later. And uh, that's why we're going to do it this time. So enjoy the pictures, but pay attention to what we're saying now. Because <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the pictures necessarily. You may, there well, may it be does, but not in order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Terry's going to start. Okay. Um, everybody always wants to know what happened with the visa, because I'm always sending a <laughs> prayer request at the end for the visas. And they, they don't issue the visas until just before you're going on the plane. So there's always an issue. And this time, when we're, you know, just getting ready to board the plane, Mark paid the money for the visas and, and got the receipt. We got on the plane, and the plane's starting to back out. And, and they said something over the loudspeaker about visas. And I said, do we have our visas? He said, uh, where are our visas? <laughs> we're like, well, I paid for them. I have the receipt. But the... The girl just the forgot lady to give didn't them, hand to him. them to me. Got and to hand I it didn't to him. Think about it. And so they were like, said, "Well, we're going to have to taxi back in and you know check this out." And and the one guy sitting behind is from Cuba and he works there and he said, "No, you can't you can't get into visa into Cuba without your visa." That's when we texted all of y'all to pray. Yeah, and so. The stewardess talked to the captain, and the captain talked to somebody, and they said, well, we're going to go ahead and go, and you'll get your visas in Cuba. And we're like, really? Are you sure? We'll get them in Cuba. <laughs> we'll get stuck there if we don't. And so we got there, and we got off the plane, and we're standing in the immigration line, and some guy comes up to us and says, do you have your visas? And we said, no. And he goes, here. <laughs> and so we had to hand fill them out like you do anyway. And so that's, that was that part. <laughs> yeah, what was the name of that movie that uh, uh, Tom Hanks was in? I, I could just picture us being stuck, you know, at yeah. the Cuban airport. Yeah. Uh, a pastor uh, who we saw in um, one of Nesty's favorite churches that he's a part of there in Cuba <coughs> uh, remembered us. I recognize his face, but uh, he... We went to the service. It was very charismatic and everything. Uh, and uh, but he came up to me and, and you know Nesty was introducing us because he and Nesty were good friends and that's how he met Jackie I think and came to my my little conference thing we did that Jackie's years ago and I gave him a Bible and I had forgotten all about it but he thanked me for the Bible and said it's been a real blessing in his life so that was just a real blessing to hear that you know and. And uh, by the way, we're hoping to work more with this other denomination I won't name because of the stories um, that uh, as future, future missions may involve this other denomination, which will be good. And they can get us visas, religious visas and everything, and so that's great. So God answered that prayer. Yeah, that's that another answer of a prayer, too. About meet new people and everything. So. Yeah. That's right. Okay, and then we went to... Um, Oh, oh I'm sorry. One more, too. and then we uh, we also one uh, we stayed at a a B and B. You can stay Airbnb. at a B and B through Airbnb in Cuba. So that's good news. We found out a lot of things like that, and that's really cool. And we went down to this train station right down the street from the B and B, and we got to witness to this guy named <laughs> Oh, this guy who was a guard there. And he knew some English. And so anybody who knows English in Cuba is always trying to practice their English on you. And we're starting to learn, oh, yeah, don't talk to them in Spanish. Talk to them in English. They want to they wanna learn. So we're learning how to do that. And uh, this was good because we did that with him, and he really had fun. And I had this video of him that didn't work because I ran out of space. But I got the first little clip of it, which is cute. We still have that. But he was a, a non-believer, came from a Catholic background. But he was just kind of one of those, well, I don't know what I believe, you know, yet. And we witnessed to him, and we told him the gospel. And then we gave him some literature. And then later we went back, and he was guarding another part of the train depot area. And we ran into him again, and he had read that. And you could tell that he was thinking about it, and his heart was beginning to open already. So that was very exciting. Answered a prayer. He didn't, you know necessarily received the Lord right there, but we think the Lord's working on him, and we think he's open. He told us he's not a fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, then we went to this church service, and um, the pastor that we know who speaks some English, he just taught a really good message that 
And he was in loop right where we would have been on that Sunday. Isn't that was that so something? cool. Exactly and, um, where we would have been. He has, he was so prepared. He has a PowerPoint with all the scriptures up there and cartoons very, and very well done. And you know, he was speaking in Spanish, and so I didn't know what he was saying, but I, I knew what he was talking about. You know, so that was really cool. Expositionally teaching God's word. And right. we had fun fellowship with that whole church after the service. And there was a girl there. She's 23 years old. And she has a disease that, what is it? Uh, they, she can't stop eating. She doesn't know how to stop eating or she won't stop And she eating. wasn't real big or anything, but she has a sister or something that a takes care of her. A lot of those kind of people get humongous and they die at a very young age. Most of them don't get over 23. And she was 23. And she is 23. And she, I asked her what her name was and she said, Barbara. And I said, what? She said, Barbara. And I said, oh, Barbara. And she said, yeah. <laughs> but we just had a really fun, took some selfies together and everything. So that was cool. She's proud of herself because she can say Barbara <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, oh, and where we stayed at our friend Nesty's, who has a legal hostel, there was a group of yeah. uh, other missionaries there from Houston that were really cool to fellowship with and and that was really neat to spend a little time with them. Yeah. So that was cool. Big church in Houston. Okay. Kyberine. Okay. The uh, amazing thing about our visit to uh, uh, one of the towns there in Cuba was that it was uh, a, a poor community. And this was what we prayed for, that the Lord would help us to reach uh, more and more of these uh smaller churches in poorer areas who are, have more need than some of the other Cuban churches that we've helped in the past and that others are already helping. So the Lord really answered that prayer and uh, we were able to go to one of those places and <laughs> you know no plan to go to the beach on this trip. We were planning to go to two weddings which is a lot of fun. Well the other one we knew wasn't going to happen but th there was one wedding we'll talk about uh, that we did get to go to but uh, no plan to go to the beach or anything like that because uh, we weren't with any groups you know that usually do stuff like that because we don't go to cuba for that but uh, i mean we don't mind doing it when we're there <laughs> with the other groups but uh that wasn't why we go there but we were in this very poor neighborhood and we stayed um in, in, in a, a poor place but what was so amazing is they invited us to go swimming in this pool and we're okay well, you know and we walked back there and this pool is like from that wall to here and from that road to there. I mean, it's a, like a pretty good sized pool. Nice pool, clean, perfectly clean. It wasn't, there wasn't any it's green. It's a beautiful area. We walked through these dirt roads and roads well, the and these little shacks was and then like into a, this like, wow. This <laughs> little concrete house is like all the rest of them that didn't look like it could possibly have a pool in the backyard. <laughs> but it did and even had a, a little seating area and it had a little extra bathroom just like you would expect. I mean, this was all, you know, poorer than us but it was just amazing so we got to swim in this pool all by ourselves one day and uh, we found out they, the church really uses that a lot uh, for activities and it and was really refreshing fellowship. it's their fellowship area because it's right across the street from where the church meets because it was after a long hot ride on a bus with the all the windows down yeah we and the, the pastor had his motorcycle on the bus <laughs> yeah he loaded a motorcycle i mean a regular like I don't know, 200 cc type bike, dirt bike, up into a bus. <laughs> that was a trip watching them do that. Okay, gotta keep moving. And what's the next one? What you shared there, the pastor. Okay. Confirmation. Yeah, that's what uh, the message I'm going to share with you here. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't share completely with them, but uh, this is the bones uh, for a more in-depth study I'm going to do next year, Lord willing in Cuba uh, called the ABCs of apologetics and um, <clears throat> it was in the whole book of Second Peter we're going to do a flyover of Second Peter <laughs> in 20 minutes maybe but anyway we'll see but it was a confirmation to him or to me because he said that was exactly what we were looking at uh, so that was just the Lord helping me to not doubt myself so much and the pastor's wife let me share with the ladies and before I shared she didn't know what I was going to talk about, but she shared Proverbs 31, and I was sharing about the keys to a good marriage. 
and then I shared my testimony, and her testimony was very similar to mine. So that was cool. Very awesome. Ran the guy from Oh, wow. We met a guy. He was the coolest black guy I've ever met. He would, well, he just did not have any kind of an accent. I mean, he was like middle American accent. I don't know where he got it, but he was from Lake Charles. He lived in Florida right then, and he came to Cuba to find out how to live there. He, he really is considering living there. And that was really exciting to me to hear what he was planning to do and all the steps he was making to do that. And you, we don't have time to tell the whole story. He just was funny, and he was telling us these amazing things that the Lord had done. And so it was just a huge blessing to run into this guy at Nesty's uh, Rancho Agua Viva, where we stayed. I can say that because that's where we were. That's the hostel we were in. It was all legal. Everything we do there is legal, of course. And... Uh, <clears throat> That guy was just really amazing, and uh, we are going to stay in touch for sure. So, okay, then um, you'll hear we more were, about him, I'm sure. We were going from house to house in this other little neighborhood, and we met this really precious couple, and they, she just had the biggest smile, and she was just so happy. And they told us a story about um, their neighbors were in to Santeria, which is you know kind of like voodoo. And they prayed and prayed and prayed for them. And, Spiritism. And they got saved, and they broke all their idols, and they had, like, a bunch of bags of idols and stuff they took and threw in the river and everything. Three bags this tall mm -hmm. full of broken-up idols they dumped into a river because it was – that wasn't pollution because it was mostly metal and concrete. So, But she was wearing a T-shirt that used to belong to Mark's grandfather. My father. Your father, because yeah. when we, yeah, when we were there one time before, we left a t-shirt there, and it says Grandpa the Greatest on it, and she was wearing his t-shirt, and it was I so kept cute. that t-shirt for a long time, <laughs> because it, it was special to me, but I gave it away. It was, it was too big for you, but yeah. anyway, that was fun. Okay. Mine? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, one day when we were in um, a town, there was a building we had walked beside that... Uh, fell down and it could have fallen on us but it didn't we saw them starting beginning to scoop it up and put it in the dumpster or in the in a truck to haul off it was you know concrete structure old concrete structure with a caved in roof that had just fallen into the street nobody got hurt and we were just thanking the lord that we didn't pass or it, when we did pass earlier that day it didn't fall on us and the people were saying they were glad it didn't fall at night because people sleep in there. It and was just an old junky house. One of the things we did often was share our Ark Encounter visit with everyone. And they loved those pictures. And uh, we're going to try to get the rest of those to them event next year because hers got stuck in the cloud. But that was a lot of fun sharing. Uh, now I'm going to talk more about that in the talk here in a little bit. But. Okay, and one day... Uh, this friend of ours came with his professor, who was his English teacher, and visited us. And there were, they said there was a lady waiting in the car. And we said, well, invite her in to, to sit with us, you know. And he said, really? And we said, yeah. So they got her out. Of, and they had just served us breakfast, so I was sh able to share a little of my breakfast with her. And her name was Denise. De Denise. But she they say things Dennis. different. <laughs> Denise. Dennis. And um, she didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Spanish and I got left alone with her because they they went to the hospital to visit his, um, somebody's mom and so I, sh I showed her every picture I had in my phone and said you know used every word I knew in Spanish and said everything <laughs> I could say and she kept trying to tell me something that I didn't understand and then this other guy came and he spoke English and Spanish and he translated and she was telling me about this big tree that's right in the middle of Cuba that tourists come from all over the world to talk to the tree and dance around it. And I said, you mean Santa Rhea? And he said, yeah. And I went, oh. <laughs> we found out that's right in the middle of the island, not far from Placetas. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. The Lord, And I didn't even know Placetas was the very middle of the island until. Yeah. <clears throat> so the Lord put us right in smack in that middle of Cuba to start working there. Seven years ago. Anyway, uh, when I when she when I was at the hospital, uh, that lady 
was was getting drawn to the Lord. The guy who took us to the hospital uh, had been witnessing to her, and uh, when he got back, we shared the Lord with her, and I mean, very clearly shared the the gospel. So she understood it, and she seemed very visibly shaken, but not saved, but just open to it. And she took the literature with her, and I think I gave her a Gideon Bible or something, but we gave her a small testament or, and, and some literature. But while we were at the hospital, uh, we were, I had some tracks, uh, eight minutes, uh, where are they? I was gonna do a little bit of show and tell. We don't have a lot of time, but there's more stuff out on the table if you wanna look at that, but we had this tract. I have to show you this because it was really cool because we had this track and I didn't want to pass out tracks in public a whole lot in this mission because of my visa and I was really hesitant to hand this one out eight minutes and, uh, until eternity or eight minutes in eternity what will what will happen eight minutes into eternity something like that I've read it trust me I have read it but anyway it's a very good track put out by Midnight Call Ministries and, uh, but this lady came up while we were sitting there in the, in the waiting area, uh, and, I, and I did visit Lester's mom, and, uh, which uh, was a, a real blessing to get to visit with her and pray for her and stuff. She's in a lot of trouble uh, physically and even mentally. But um, uh, this lady passed out these tracks to people who were sitting there. She was just giving one to everybody. She was a Cuban lady just going around giving these tracks to everybody in the waiting area and I thought well that's cool if she can do it maybe I can do it you know and I I went ahead and gave some of the, I gave one of these to her and she gave one to me and um, so we gave tracks to a lot of people there that was cool but anyway um, that's it except for the wedding which should I share that now or let you no go ahead the wedding we got to go to was of a two uh, missionaries really uh, one lives and was from Merida Mexico and one is from Cuba uh, and they were just a precious couple who've gone through a whole lot of problems uh, trying to get married and uh, but they are married legally and they had their wedding finally and that was July 20 whatever it was 28 28 they had to have a civil wedding first yeah. before they could have their... And we got to go to the wedding. wedding, and it started two hours late, which is kind of normal <laughs> Hispanic culture, you know. <laughs> Even weddings can start two hours late. But it was a wedding that went really well. And I know Satan was probably fighting in, in, some, fighting in, in some ways, and, and everything really went well, I think. Uh, who knows? Lord only knows how many things that he had to bring together to make it be such a beautiful and great wedding. And... And one thing that was a real blessing to us is we had brought a couple of large items, which are harder for them to get from the States, in our suitcases for them. One was a fan, and one was a, a, one of those uh, water heaters that you just that you pick El up. And electric it's, teapot. Yeah, the kind that heats from within, you know. So you, and you can set it in your hand right after you. I love that feature of one of those pots. Anyway, <clears throat> we brought that to give them, and um, it turns out, the day after they got the fan, and we didn't get to give it to him personally. Someone had to bring it to him because of logistics and their, their honeymoon and stuff. We didn't get to see him after the wedding. But the person who gave him the fan, gave him the fan on the very day their fan blew up. So that was the Lord. Yeah. Timing, totally. I mean, not blew up, but just died or whatever. Their fan died the day they got a new one. So that was really cool. So anyway, the Lord did a lot of things there. We don't have time to share all of them. We'd love to share more with anybody who wants to. And pictures and videos, we can come to your house or you can come to ours or whatever. And we want to share all uh, the things the Lord did. But these are just some of the highlights that we remembered that were really amazing that the Lord did. And uh, uh, we have numbers. We haven't tallied all the numbers up, but it was over 20, somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, pastors and leaders that we were able to bless in some way or the other and uh, we're hoping to do more next time all right I want to share the message that we gave uh, just not really we didn't teach or preach there but um, 
I had a message that I was able to share with people who wanted to hear it, and there were quite a few who wanted to hear. Um, how do we escape the corruption that's in the world by lust? Peter tells us. If you want to turn with me to Second Peter, we're going to fly through the book of Second Peter to try to give you the highlights, the ABCs of... Where's my notes? Where'd they go? Oh, here they are. The ABCs of apologetics ministry. Um, Second Peter has a lesson for us in adding to faith according to his absolute authority and the authentic apostles' knowledge. Notice all the A's. Uh, it's all about the Alpha and Omega, Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2 is, uh, uh, but, even though we have all that in Christ, we need to beware, be, be, but being wary of Balaam's of Beor by becoming biblically balanced Bereans. That's chapter 2. Be error free. Chapter 2, be error free. That's the B's. And then the C's are the commandment of apostles care for Christians from creationism to Christ's coming and consummation. Uh, that's Christ's charismos. Now, that's a Spanish word, but that's the very first word in chapter 3 is charismos, which is just the word beloved. He uses that word a number of times. Uh, in fact, Paul, Peter's use of words and the number of times he uses them highlights some of the really interesting themes in this book, and, and I don't know if you've ever heard it taught this way, but I'm about to do it as quick as I can. Uh, it's really interesting uh, how many things Peter says in this book that aren't really said anywhere else, and how many uh, times he refers to certain things, like the word error and the word precious, and other words like that that don't appear that many times in the Bible at all, but he uses these words. And are words important? They're very important, and I tell you what, I did what Tim recommended, and I actually, and this is one of the reasons I was so late getting my notes ready, but I actually wrote out all of Second Peter on these pieces of paper here, and I tell you what, I challenge you, I know you've got to do Psalm 1 first, that's our homework, do your homework first, after that, if you're in the sword sharpeners class, write out Second Peter sometime, it will... It will bring so much more out that you never really noticed. I think uh, it helped me. To, I didn't even realize there's how many places he repeats himself, and I'm going to get into that in a second here. Okay, so chapter 1, let's read it. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained the like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, uh, I, I want to say right off the bat that the, I think the basic theme, really, of Peter, I know it's about false teachers, but I like to think of uh, Peter being more of, of uh, this first verse and last verse because, you know, any good outline or any good exposition has a basic theme, and, and you usually start, with your theme and you end with your theme so you can make people remember it. If you look at chapter 3, verse 18, he says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be, glo both, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So you see, he's talking about growing in grace through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He talks about grace and peace being multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. So we get what Peter wants us to get through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He is the answer to all of our needs. And I love the bookends of this, this book. Um, it's a perfect outline. Uh, he, he gives us there for um, the main thing which is jesus christ that is the center of it all and we're going to get into that a little more here in a second but it says um apostle <clears throat> there's your a 
if you're, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to squeeze Peter into my ABC thing. It really kind of was there, uh, but um, I kind of am, I admit it. But the A for apostle and apostolic authority is certainly a theme of this book, or especially of this chapter. The word uh, apostle uh, is is used here, uh, no, the, the word apostle here is not used a special number of times, but uh, it is used only in uh, Peter and Paul's letters when they are affirming their own apostleship. Peter and Paul are the only ones that actually do that, and, and Peter is the only one who mentions uh, the commands of the apostles, uh, and, and that comes later in the book, but what's interesting is that Jesus is the first apostle, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. He is a, a number one apostle. I bet you didn't know that. But anyway, he is. He's our apostolic, uh, authentic authority according to his divine power. So, <clears throat> verse 3. I should have read 1 through 3 because uh, it's really kind of, Altogether, but this book kind of breaks it up, so I, I will too. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, that's Jesus Christ. So we have all things that we need through him, and that's why we need to know him. That's why we need to know his word, because that's where we get all these things that we need in life. And there's people looking to all kinds of other things besides God's word to get the, all that they need. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and they use the excuse, excuse that all truth is God's truth, because if it's not in the Bible and it's true, it's God's truth. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's wiser to use all of the truth that's in Scripture for all of those things in life and not look outside of the Scriptures for our answers, especially to the issues of our souls. Uh, you know, there are other sciences and things that are useful, I admit. But uh, psychology is one of those things that tends to use that as an excuse to uh, help people who have soul issues, and they don't look to God's Word to deal with those. Peter alone, uh, oh, I already said that. Then the knowledge of him. The word knowledge is one of those things that Peter uses more than, uh, only in Peter I mean, only in Proverbs, Isaiah, and 1 Corinthians is the word knowledge used more than in the book of Peter. Uh, now, sometimes when I'm talking about this, I'm including 1 Peter, and I can't remember. I should say it right here. But I think it includes, well, I think he uses the word know or knowledge or, or knows, any, any version of the word knowledge um, 16 times just in 2 Peter. Uh, it may include First Peter. I don't. I should have made a note if it did. But the fact is, is he wants people to know about Jesus Christ and these and these things where he says, for instance, in verse four, whereby you're, whereby are given unto us exceeding and great, exceeding great and precious promises. That's the word of God. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having esca- escaped. The corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, he, and then he, he goes on to list all these things that we're to add to our faith. Now, I want to make a note about the precious faith. He also uses the word precious more than anybody else in the Bible. And he calls our faith precious first. And that's the first thing we have to have is our faith. But then we add to our faith these things. And we learn how to do that through his precious promises. That's the, old, that's the whole word of God. We'll learn that as we read on. But, and I don't have time to study the whole chapter. Obviously, you'll have to read these on your own. But the things he says that we'll add to our faith is virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, kindness, and charity. And those are all things that, you know, are indicative of love. And, and you know, that's, that's one of the most important things. I think in this book is it teaches us how that God's word and the knowledge of Jesus Christ is what's going to get us to a a uh, a better faith, a better walk with the Lord, uh, a better ability to to resist false teachers, 
and to resist uh, the false uh, prophets that uh, had come against them and are certainly among us now, even more so now, I think. Uh, another word that is uh, in, in um, this little book uh, very often quoted was uh, the word according, and that word uh, appears uh, many times uh, in chapter 1 and 2, but only Romans and Ephesians use the word according more than he does, except for Ezekiel in the Old Testament. But he uses the word according, and uh, according to his divine power and authority. Uh, so we need to uh, add to our faith, the precious faith is first, by the precious promises in Jesus, which you can see more about in Ephesians and Colossians, for example, we add all according to his divine power. And uh, as in the second Adam, able to add all. Uh, okay, authority as in the second Adam, able to add all. I'm doing a bunch of A's there, which is kind of silly. But anyway, let's go ahead and look at chapter <coughs> 2. Oh, no. I have to say one more thing about chapter 1. Uh Oh, I have to say a lot more. Sorry. <clears throat> he does. He does use the word "remember" a lot. Uh, in fact, more than others. But when you're when you're repeating things, it helps to repeat things. And when you read this, you realize he's repeated quite a few things, quite a few different times. He uses um, many words over and over. And I don't think those are accidents. We uh, we need to be careful uh, thinking anything like that in the Bible is an accident. If we see something repeated, there's a good little marker that you're you're seeing something important. Jesus said that verily, verily, you know. So that's like listen up, listen up. And uh, so he uses the word remember, and he wants them to remember what he's teaching them. So he repeats it. <laughs> but let me read verse 12, uh, 12 through. 14 about that wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though ye know them and, and be established in the present truth yea I think it is meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me moreover I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance so there you are, you know, all those times he said remembrance. Now, I want to say something about Jesus Christ. He's mentioned Jesus Christ, Christ eight times, Savior five times. Uh, the name Jesus is mentioned in this book, um, where did it go? Seven times, nine in total. Lord is 15 times, five times in chapter one. Do you get the picture here? He, he uses the word Christ more than any letters in the Bible of that size. Now, if you look at it in, in a, in a uh, Strong's Concordance, you'll see that Peter really talks a lot about Jesus here, more so than others. He's often mentioning his Lord, Jesus Christ, you know, or Jesus Christ our Lord or our our Savior, he uses the word Savior five times more than uh, only Titus and Isaiah use the word Savior more than Peter did in this little epistle. So he, he's pointing to Jesus Christ, the only Savior. And, uh, and that's big in chapter 1, but it's all through his book. Now, um, verse 19, well, let's see. Oh, we can't skip 16 to 18. That's the one of the most important parts right here. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables... When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. Remember in the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So, they are authentic witnesses of Jesus, true apostles authorized by Jesus, the apostle, <laughs> there's the A again, to affirm the truth. 
And this is why he says that. But there's something more. He says we have also, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. <clears throat> Knowing this, well, let me say this. The more sure word of prophecy means that there were other writers who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, which he'll get into. He mentions the inspiration by the Holy Spirit here in verse 21. Uh, <clears throat> but they were inspired, just, and they were just as authoritative. And so, in other words, Peter here in this letter is telling us that everything the apostles wrote, everything the saints wrote in the Old Testament, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, is all authoritative. So the whole Bible is yours for the devouring, and I recommend you eat it, all of it, the whole thing. Don't leave any of it out, because it's all authoritative, and it's all God-breathed, and it's all good for you. Verse, uh, i got to finish the chapter, though. Knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake, Moved by the Holy Ghost. So that's where scripture came from. It came from God. It came from the Holy Spirit. And even Paul uh, affirmed here at the end uh, of that, you know, he wrote scripture. You know, his letters were scriptures. I, I, I would assume Peter might have guessed that even his own pronouncements were going to be scriptures. Because he was speaking with apostolic authority, he knew it. Because he knew it wasn't him. I think Peter had learned it didn't you if i thought it was me i couldn't stand up here anymore i i just couldn't you have to learn that it's not you or you won't be able to be used by the lord it's the lord it's the lord working through you now there are times i get in his way and say things he didn't want me to say that's true but uh, and i'm not speaking with apostolic authority but as long as i'm quoting this book i am okay so chapter 2 uh is being wary of Balaam's of Beor by becoming biblically balanced Bereans, be error free. That's what this chapter is about. And he starts out with the, the word but uh, in English, but that doesn't mean anything in Spanish because I have to do this in Spanish, you know. <clears throat> Apostles and all that does work in Spanish, but the, the but doesn't work there. But anyway, the bees are the uh, brute beasts or blemishes beguiling souls and following Balaam of Beor. Those are all words right out of the text in chapter 2. <laughs> but let me read verse 1 and 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Covetousness is another one of those words that, <clears throat> uh, of course that's a C, I know, but anyway, covetousness uh, it was only used by Jesus and Jeremiah and Paul more than, than Peter did. Peter used that word in this book uh, more than, they, than everyone else in the Bible except for Jeremiah and Paul and Jesus. So he's showing us one of the big signs of a false teacher. A sign of a bad teacher and bad doctrine is covetousness. For instance, word of faith, seeker-friendly, and license, license to sin progressives. They all have similar thing they are looking for what they can get out of this life they're not really teaching the truth of god they're they're using the truth to get rich off of unstable souls which is what he talks about here and i don't have time to get into the details but i would like to read verse uh, 12 to 16 but these as natural brute beasts made made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with your own, with their own deceivings, while they feast with you. 
having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of uh, Beor, or Bozor, who, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. So, <clears throat> I can think of quite a few of these in our times, and I'm not going to try to list them right now, but you can too. In verse 18, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, wantonness, those that were clean, escaped from them who live in error. So, uh, that's another word he mentions, error, which is only, uh, that word only comes up in um, Jude 11, and, uh, and that's the same exact quote. In fact, I wonder if Peter borrowed from Jude. Uh, I believe he may have read Jude first. I forget what Tim said, but we, who knows who read who, but they, one of them copied the other, or was inspired by the same Holy Spirit for sure, but uh, they, they both mentioned Balaam, and, uh, and that's one of the uh, few places the word error even shows up. So if you want to be careful about living, you know, living in error, we need to repent. If we're living in error, we need to repent. If you don't want to live in error, his word corrects error. And I think that's one of the main themes of this book is how God's word will correct the errors. Uh, and we are enslaved by our own lust. Verse 19 uh, makes that. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Uh, that's, that's a very uh, axiomatic truth right there. M most people r recognize that. Whatever thing you're hooked to, you're enslaved by that thing. Now, you may think you just love doing that thing, and, and you probably do. But if you love doing that thing so much that you can't quit that thing, then that thing owns you. You know, you're enslaved to it. And that's exactly what he's talking about. We all know what he's talking about there. But uh, that's very axiomatic truth. Um, now, chapter 3 begins with the word. Let me... It's the commandment of apostles' care for Christians from creationism to Christ's coming and consummation. That's what chapter 3 is. Christ's charismos. Charismos is Spanish for beloved. We are Christ's beloved. And, and uh, Paul often used the word beloved. A lot of guys use the word beloved. I don't think uh, Peter had anything on anybody using that word, but he did use it a lot in this book. Um, and he said, Beloved, that was the first word in the Greek, I now write unto you the second epistle, in both which I stir up your minds by way of remembrance. There you go again. He's, the word mind also appears uh, a lot more in uh, Peter. In fact, it's, uh, here it is right here. Six times in Peter's letters. Um, that's both of his letters. But he's, the word mind or mindful, that's what he's trying to do is stir up our minds. And remind us, uh, verse 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord. Now, that sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? If you think about it, saying, you need to remember what we apostles have told you. But he's not being arrogant. He's telling you the truth because he got it from Jesus. He didn't come up with this truth. Neither did you or me. So don't take any credit for it. I can't take any credit for teaching you any of these things. This is all Peter's writings, and, and guess where he got it? He got it from God. So who's the ultimate authority? See, God's word is the ultimate authority. We can't go anywhere else. If we do, we're going to get in trouble, and people do all the time. They don't take God's word seriously enough and realize that he is the ultimate authority, and so is his word. There isn't one part of his word that's not authoritative, not even one little place. We've got to keep that in mind. So Peter 
is caring for the church and loving the church by reminding them of the words of the Savior. And one of the things he, he does here is he goes all the way back to creation. And this is where I'm going to run out of time, and I hate it because I learned some really cool C's from the Ark Encounter. Uh, well, not the Ark Encounter, but Ken Ham, who has the, the, the C's of, uh, from creation to consummation. I'll try to go over those real quick if I have a chance. But <clears throat> in chapter 3, he introduces uniformitarianism. Let me read that. That's chapter 3, verse 2 to 4. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So he's talking about creation, and he's talking about people who think that because things have smoothed out since the end of the flood, that's the way it's always been. And he's saying, no, 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 it wasn't. There was very different before the flood, and the flood was a huge disaster. And, you know, he is affirming biblical creation. Do you hear the ABC there? Affirming biblical creation. That's one of the ABCs here. We need to affirm biblical creation. Genesis 1 to 11, he is doing that, and he's going to go on here, and he totally affirms it by mentioning them by name. Uh, for one thing, the words matter. He uses the word creation. He uses the word Noah. He uses the, you know, the, even the, verse 5, for this they are willingly ignorant. That means dumb on purpose. Uh, I like that, dumb on a porpoise. For this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. We don't have time to talk about all the science there, but it's really cool that they believe that the earth actually had water all the way under it, a lot more than it, it, that's even on top right now. <clears throat> anyway, that, that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So he, he describes how the world was flooded by the water that was under, basically, being overflowed, perished. Uh, and so he affirms the flood of Noah. And, uh, uh, but, the, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. He's going to talk more about that in a minute. Let's skip down and say, uh, verse 9, this is why we pray um, oh, I'm sorry, verse 8, I wanted to say, but one thing about that real quick. Well, I'm out of time. I'm not going to. God's outside of time, verse 8. We should pray that God's kingdom come, verse 9. He mentions our Savior five times in the book. He's our Savior from what? The coming judgment of God. So if he's our Savior, we need to know what we're being saved from. A lot of people think they're being saved from a lot of things, but... The, the main thing they're being saved from is eternal damnation. But there's also a physical uh, punishment coming to the earth, too, that, the, that he's saving them from. And he's not slack. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He loves them. <clears throat> now, in verse 10 to 12, you get more repetition. And I'm going to let you study that on your own. But that repetition is there for a reason. I don't think that's an accident. When you see the phrase... Um, shall be dissolved and the elements shall ver uh, melt with fervent heat. That's stated twice. That's so we get it. It's all really going to burn, literally the whole universe. That kind of knocks out the UFO idea. So what's left is the most important part, I think, and that's these last 14 verses, or last verses from 14 on. Let me read this. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. 
You therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. And he, he, he told them how to do that, and it was through Jesus Christ. And that's the whole point. Jesus Christ is the whole point. He is the, uh, the bookend itself. He's the Alpha and the Omega, uh, the beginning and the end. So I'm out of time, and I hope you picked up on the ABCs of apologetics through the book of 2 Peter. Read it carefully. Write it out if you want someday, and you'll be amazed at how powerful that little book is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word, for your peace that passes understanding that we have because we're in Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about anything because you are in control of everything, and we need simply to really believe you, take your word seriously, and obey your word. And I thank you for the privilege I had to share some of this with the Cubans but, Lord, every day for all of us, it's a challenge to share with everybody around us the truth of your word, Lord. And, and a lot of times we're quiet and we don't speak up. And sometimes I speak up when I should be quiet. But, Lord, just lead us and help us to be real students of your word because we love you. We know you. We want to know you. And we know you want us to know you. We know that you want us to obey your commands because you love us. And you love all those around us. So, Lord, please help us to share our faith more. Bring a large group with us next year if you don't come back to get us. Lord, just do whatever you want to do in Calvary Chapel, Tyler, to spread the gospel, the good news of your salvation that you want to give everyone. And you're not willing that any would perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, God, help us. In Jesus' name, amen.